Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to ESOF 2012. Our first duty is a happy one. Could you please welcome Uchtron the Heron, the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. And to welcome Uchtron and Aaron to speak, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Patrick Cunningham. Uchtron Dielish, dear President, um, it's my first privilege and duty here at Euroscience, Euroscience Open Forum, to welcome you to our gathering. Uh, to thank you for agreeing to chair our op the opening of our conference uh, and also to say some words of introduction. Uh, Michael D. Higgins has been a university teacher in political science and sociology. Uh, he's been a member of parliament for 25 years. He was a cabinet minister and since last year uh, has been elected president of Ireland. He was and still is a poet and a writer of consequence. He's also a statesman uh, and a passionate campaigner over many years uh, for equality and human rights. Uh, Well, a coherent area, Sarah Stoit, is a commissioner, Cree, is a Iana Esulia Tofir Kino, Saran Veliv, August is more an honor of some pleasure to Veliv Tranona, Eren Okoit, Tovoktok, Kiluruk Shah, August is Inton and Ame, Conan Bay Makar, Eren Yarkna, August and Sokui. Ministers, distinguished guests, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to be here today on this special and celebratory occasion. I think anyone who has worked in university will realize, I think, the lamp has shone on science recently, and you should all enjoy it. But I'd like to thank Professor Patrick Cunningham for inviting me to join you here this evening, and indeed to all of you for that very warm welcome. It was special to Amhain, to a chance I'm Castle Mair Kolyaki, a more gigan Quinn Commissioner, Ear Balden the Dolium, a Gasir Kolyakis and Rilthus, a Gas Ear Onadias Gallia here. And indeed, all of my former colleagues in, uh, in, in government. I'd like to welcome particularly all our guests from abroad to our shores for what promises to be an outstanding general science conference with an interesting, challenging, and exciting program. I, I thought the program just wonderful, a program that contains a welcome interdisciplinary emphasis and a particularly welcome to a location of scientific, practical, and uh, ethical issues together. I hope you've been enjoying our Irish hospitality and that you'll have some opportunity to enjoy uh, all that this capital city has to offer. You know, we in Ireland are proud of our reputation for creativity, for originality, and for our unique and imaginative view of the world. But when we say that, people usually turn to uh, great uh, writers, dramatists, and others. But if the average person was asked to give the basis, as I've said, for this worldwide reputation, while they would be quite likely to cite James Joyce's great Ulysses, and indeed some of our taxi drivers might claim to have driven him in their taxi, uh, or the magnificent poetry of Seamus Heaney, the plays of John Millington Singh, or the theater of Brian Friel, or the extraordinary wonderful work of Tom Murphy in the modern period. Unfortunately, not really all of them would mention prominent parts of the Irish intellectual achievement, which is just as important, older, and maybe even more central. 
Bell's theorem, the development of fibre optics in communication, the splitting of the atom, the Beaufort scale, or the effectiveness of the mariner's compass, or the many other inventive and forward-thinking achievements which we owe their success to the innovation, creativity, and above all, original thinking of talented Irish scientists. Ireland has a long and distinguished tradition of excellence in scientific achievement. Understandably, people often think of our Nobel laureate in physics, Ernst, Ernst Walton, when considering our contribution. However, I have spoken since I became president of our the importance of our recognizing the scores of other scientists who have laid the groundwork for the efforts we celebrate today. We can be rightly proud of Robert Boyle, often called the father of chemistry, John Tyndall of County Carlo, and his pioneering work on radiant heat and the germ theory of disease. Astronomer Agnes Mary Clark of Skibreen, after whom a crater on the moon is named. Lucy Everest Boole, pioneering pharmaceutical chemist. These and many others are the forerunners of today's Irish scientists who established the foundation of excellence on which the scientists of today build. I have to say, when I looked at the program too, and I saw the suggestion, you know, that it is of stars we are made, I began to think of that person who has, in fact, taken the title of my poem in the second volume, Stardust, which opens, it is of stardust we are made. Science today, however, is being reimagined, and I think this is the most important thing I have to say, in a new and global cultural context that sees it in a far more engaged and challenged way than any functional narrowness of recent times might suggest. As a nation, we must have the confidence and continue to remember our proven aptitude for physics, for chemistry, for technological development, our great ability to push the boundaries outwards, our restless creative energy and curiosity that translates to a constant exploration of how things work and how they can be done better, more effectively, more efficiently, above all else, with more general benefit. The moral challenge is ever greater now. Science has to be delivered in a world that carries the scars of policies that sow the relationship of states and people, our greatest resources, as an exploitative one. We are a long way from the results of Francis Bacon who said, I lead to you nature and all her children in bondage for your usage, with all the resonant assumptions and that are in it. Our new responsibilities are to a planet already made fragile and a global population of which so many, a great proportion, has been excluded. In recent years, we have undertaken in this country a significant programme of investment in science and research and can now fittingly highlight on the international stage the fruits of that program. And that is why you are all so welcome and why it is such a celebratory moment and a moment on which I congratulate the organizers of bringing conference and a dialogue of this quality and importance to Dublin. But nearly half of all foreign direct investment in Ireland from business last year was in research and development projects. And we've also seen the addition of many new scientific posts to our third-level institutions. So there is no doubt that as a nation we continue to have much to offer the world of science and technology. And thus it is of great benefit and encouragement to have been given this opportunity to share the best of Ireland and the best of Irish research with others at this very large gathering of scientists, business leaders, science enthusiasts, and those who simply want to see the contribution of science made max maximized in terms of social dividend. I'm delighted that during my first year as president, Dublin has been designated as the city of science. And during this special year, we will have a valuable opportunity to bring together the worlds of arts, culture, and science, exploring the link between these domains and ensuring that we fully utilize our creativity in all its forms. I said at the very beginning of my presidency in November that I wanted it to be a presidency of ideas, and I couldn't but then be excited from the sheer breadth of the papers and discussions that are going to be given at this conference. 
and I congratulate the organisers for that breadth and also for that inclusiveness and the intersection that there is between the themes that are being discussed. I have spoken too early on of the limitless possibilities that are there if together we play to all of our strengths, what I have described as our Fedruk Thigan children. We must aspire to turn the best of ideas into living realities for all of our people, realising our limitless possibilities. This indeed is closely linked to the journey from scientific discovery to application, appreciation, as well as the process of transforming the outputs of publicly funded research into successful commercial applied innovations and outcomes, all themes that will be explored over the course of this conference. I know that the Science and the City Public Engagement Programme is set to run for 10 days around the conference here in Dublin, and delegates will have the opportunity to engage with the general public and the general public will likewise engage with science and scientific teams around this exciting time. I note as an example of multidisciplinary innovative thinking that the conference has engaged 20 of Ireland's well-known poets to contribute 12 lines on the theme of science. John Dean's poem, uh, The Moon and the Stars, on the coming of electricity to rural homes in Ireland, captures the wonder of science, that joint step into the new world, it also reminds us of the wonder of nature and what is truly valuable, what is truly valuable, both of which are often put in, at risk as societies develop. Do take time to read the small book of poems edited by Iggy McGovern of Trinity College, a copy of which is in each of your conference packs, and I'm sure you'll find new and original thinking on your subject from the perspective of the poet. It is a past time for those of us who are poets, uh, those of us who, uh, and those of you who are scientists, uh, to listen to, to each other. I referred uh, to uh, that wonderful paper that is there about the materials of stars. The opening poem in my own second collection was Stardust. It was, it is of stardust we are moulded by vapours and fragments from the making and breaking of galaxies. We are the broken bits of our cosmos, moved by traces of embedded memory, lurching always towards our image of hopes unrealized and fading. The promise of our as yet uncreated wholeness remains, however weak. That wholeness that will deliver science into society is powerfully assisted by a conference like this with papers chosen in such a generous way, a generous way of listening to each other, I am looking forward to seeing further reconnection of the arts with the scientists, with science during this momentous year for Irish science. For there is a need for a connecting discourse of science, technology, society, and culture. And this is the, a, a pervading theme throughout this conference. And I hope it will encourage continued innovation and original interdisciplinary thinking. For there can be no doubt that recognizing and being open to new paradigms of thought and action can only enrich our social, cultural and economic development and lead to a common shared future built on the spirit of cooperation, the collective will, real participation and an exciting sense of what might be possible. Now is the time for all of us to contribute to the debate about the economic model that will guide Ireland and indeed Europe into the future and towards an economy that is growth oriented and delivers jobs but is also sustainable over the longer term and fair in the opportunities it offers to all our citizens to participate in society. What you discuss is also of relevance for those crafting the Irish and European policy in relation to development theory and practice in the wider world. Innovation based on creative original thinking is the key to unlocking Ireland's future economic potential. However, this has to be done through the adoption of approaches that are sustainable, addressing the world's resource, climate and environmental challenges, providing employment opportunities and promoting full participation, and working with the full support of local, regional, national, European Union and international level policies. Thankfully, there is growing awareness that the economies of the world need to be put on a more sustainable path, that current systems of production and consumption need to be reimagined and reinvented 
and that we need to use our resources more efficiently. And I would say, with moral responsibility, if we are to secure a future for all, we cannot be regarded as either moral or sustainable if, for example, we allow the hunger of the world to be a matter of speculation. Recently, Professor Howard Stein read a paper here in Trinity College in which he spoke of commodity markets, and he spoke as follows. Commodity markets are being driven not by fundamentals of producers and inducers, but by other factors. And among other things, commodities are seen as a good hedge when the value of the dollar falls, which lowers the value of global commodities in non-dollar terms. Strategies now include speculation on food, which has become a biosubstitute for fuels with frightening implications to the welfare of millions of net food buyers in poor developing countries. In 2011, for example, it is estimated that 61% of the wheat futures market was held by speculators, compared to only 12% in the mid-90s prior to deregulation. We cannot pretend that these, are not fa that these facts are independent of the issue or the challenges of science and its application, its addressing of the food problems of the world. The result, of course, was a steep rise in food prices, which more than doubled between June 2003 and June 2008. The impact on food consumers in poor African countries is well documented, and on it goes. But we are living in an age where technological and scientific advancement although a positive and necessary thing, constantly challenges us. With each new technological and scientific breakthrough come a set of difficult questions. In a globalized economy, it is increasingly important that governments and business act together to ensure an environment that respects and implements a balance between ethics and economics. And that words mean some kind of moral implication and commitment. With the advance of globalization come new responsibilities. And I'm sure you will hear from people like my predecessor, Mary Robinson, a claim that what we need is little less than a globalization of ethics. We know that the world's population will increase from 7 billion today to 9 billion in 2050. And with this global food supply, we'll need to, we'll need to double. We will need to achieve this increased production under increasingly tight water and land constraints. And to do this successfully, we must reconcile those urgent goals, the achievement of global food security, with the safeguarding of biodiversity, the protection of our environment. The challenge will continue to be finding ways to increase production with fewer resources. However, the most urgent need is to have the courage to take cognizance of indigenous wisdom in so many parts of the world to take account of those who toil in the fields for survival, the women with their hoes in West Africa, to jettison programs that have such an ideological bias as would sacrifice those who labor in favor of imposed, non-verified models of commodification in agriculture. Our development proposals must in the future be based on rights, respect, dignity, and sufficiency. It is essential that we understand too that sustainable development is not a set of problems to be solved, but as John Crowley of UNESCO tells us, an enduring condition to be lived with. So business and business development policies cannot focus solely on their responsibility to earn profit for their shareholders, but must include respect for the environment and for local communities, a value on human rights, fair working conditions, and an eradication of corruption. In this way, we can build a promising future underpinned by a solid foundation of excellent science and technological innovation, informed by a contemporary ethic founded on a justice drawing on the need of the many rather than the speculative adventures of the few. I want to say as a poet, too, that one of the things we do, I think that, therefore, you need, I think, in poetry to have a discipline for the line, and science requires discipline. Uh, but both of us are the beneficiaries at times of ser the serendipitous finding. And that serendipity will always be important in, in science. It is something that is very important in Irish, the connection between Irish science and Irish arts. I'd like to thank the Euroscience Organization for this awarding this magnificent event to Ireland. You honor not only Ireland and Irish scientists, but all of us Irish by doing so. And it is an honor for which we are deeply appreciative 
and I hope indeed that you have a wonderful conference. It is a great time to be working in science. It is a great time to be reimagining the world that is waiting yet to be born. And it is a great time, Mar Gurth May, Conor Federic Tri Gonchoran, a court concrete. It is a very great pleasure being with you. Thank you all very much. I wish this conference well. Gurmila Mahaki Galer. So on, uh, Mr. President, uh, I think we owe you a great debt of thanks, um, not just that you've come here, but that you've taken the trouble to give us uh, not a perfunctory speech, but one in which you've reflected uh, and indeed shared some wisdom outside our normal span of interest. I mean, most of us here are scientists, and we spend not our, not our full lives, but a good part of it in white coats. Uh, in our laboratories or at our computers uh, and very focused on what we do. And we do occasionally need a reminder that our work is uh, of relevance to society uh, and that it's, uh, it's not just pushing the frontiers of knowledge, but that it also connects with other aspects of the culture. In other words, science is, is one stream of culture and it's not detached from the rest. So we, we thank you very much for your presence uh, and indeed for your very, very, very reflective, uh, reflective talk to us. Tommy, Anabuyach, as an righteous Diane, a hook to win. Mr. President, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Uchtrona Heron, President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. Now we have further speakers to come here. I'm going to welcome those to come on stage if they can, please. Uh, I think that's. It is actually quite apt, by the way, that it would be uh, Uchtrona Michael D. Higgins uh, who would speak. In many ways, poetry is what we are renowned for, but to feel that breadth of, of those ideas coming together, to see the, the wider implications of what, we're, of what you're doing here, ladies and gentlemen, this is in many ways a fantastic city for you to have a conference about science because of the hunger for it here we've seen in the last few days, and also because of a city that deals always in collaboration, in conversation, in the exchange of ideas, which is one of the many themes of ESOF, which is to bring together people. In fact, informally, ESOF have set up a series of different units through the city where people will come together and talk. We know them as pubs, but by all means, uh, if you could just... And the traditional unit of fluid measurement, a pint, is uh, sacrosanct, uh, to be honest, uh, in that situation. But by all means, ask for whatever units you want. It is there. We basically want you to, it, over the course of the next four days, ladies and gentlemen, with the breadth of scale and the number of different ideas, to come together as much as possible. I'm sure these are many themes that will be drawn on by our speakers, the first of whom, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is Andrew Nelson. We've already briefly heard from him, uh, but could we please uh, welcome the Chief Scientific Advisor of the Government and Chair of ESOF 2012 to welcome the delegates, Professor Patrick. Cunningham. Um, I suppose my, my first general duty is to welcome you here to Dublin and in particular to the, uh, this magnificent conference centre. A few years ago when we started to make the bid, in fact it was just bricks and mortar, very little glass, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, we probably are the largest event to host, be hosted in it since it was established. At any rate, I think it's living up well, and I, I hope you admire the architecture. The, that magnificent glass drum that you see outside uh, was a conception of uh, a very distinguished Irish architect uh, called Roach, uh, who comes from Mitchellstown in County Cork, but has spent most of his life in, in, uh, in New York, and he's very, very... Uh, distinguished, not just in America, but, but around the world. So, in, in a sense, by being here, we, we, we celebrate his art, as well as uh, the functionality of the building. Um, also, of course, we welcome you not just to this building and to this city, but to Ireland. Um, Ireland, uh, let me remind you, is about 1% of the economic weight of the European Union. So, we're very small, and to some extent, we're very marginal, as those of you who had 
to take long flights to get here will we'll realize. Uh, but we have um, come through um, troubled histories like, uh, like almost every country in Europe. Uh, but in recent years, we, to some extent, uh, found our measure uh, as we grappled with the challenge of building what's now known as the Knowledge Society. And it was driven by a very purposeful set of reports that were produced by the government uh, by uh, citizens, informed citizens, uh, in working in committee uh, more than a decade ago. And out of that came a determination to build a science establishment in this country that would be make the country internationally competitive. So starting about the year 2000, uh, the uh, government commitment, and that was paralleled by the commitment of business generally, uh, to ramping up uh, the science establishment and science performance of this country uh, has really been pursued uh, with vigor uh, and, and with vision, I should say, uh, for a 10-year period. And we have added about 3,500 research positions, um, mainly located in our universities, but told to face outwards and to look at the society that pays them and which they have to serve. Now, that doesn't mean they shouldn't look to the stars also, and look to the pushing back the boundaries of knowledge. But this kind of uh, convergence of the curiosity-driven science and uh, it turning it eventually to, to economic purpose uh, was really at the heart of all of that policy, and it's served us very well. And even as we come through the current difficulties, in fact, it's these um, modernized and forward-looking sectors of, the, of our economy that have, uh, have served us best. Um, we have over 70 countries represented here, um, so I could also take the opportunity of welcoming you to Europe, uh, of which we are, of course, all, all a part. Um, and uh, Europe, of course, uh, as uh, you will hear, no doubt, in more detail from uh, Commissioner Morgan and Quinn, uh, is itself gearing up for a new vision and a new future in Europe, and I'll, I'll leave that to her. So let me move on and uh, do another small duty, which, apart from welcoming you, is to uh, acknowledge some of our supporters. Um, foremost among them, of course, is the Irish government, which uh, the outgoing government and that which replaced it have, um, have held their nerve on science through these difficult years. And uh, I'm particularly pleased that uh, uh, Minister Richard Bruton and Minister Sean Sherlock have taken the trouble to uh, give, give evidence of their commitment, not just to science, but to the ESOF event as, a, as an Irish-led enterprise, uh, are here uh, to share it with us. Uh, and that, that commitment, uh, as I say, uh, we hope will continue. In fact, we're, we're confident it will. But there are a number of other sponsors that I, I, I think in, in, in duty and in gratitude I should mention. Uh, the commission uh, um, comes actually at the top of the list in terms of scale, and, and the depth of our cooperation with them. And I think on a, on a level that we, has not been reached on previous ESOFs, uh, the friendly and effective cooperation on several fronts with the Commission's services uh, really uh, speak to the sense of common purpose that we in, in ESOF and in neuroscience have uh, with the, the central policies and, and activities from Brussels. Uh, but we've also had very strong support from some of our local organizations, of which I'd like to mention Science Foundation Ireland, which is the main funding body here, and FERFOS, which is the science policy body in the country, which has supported as well. Um, major um, industrial partners have been Janssen, Intel, and IBM, and there's a long list of others which you can read and which, uh, to which we also owe gratitude uh, for support in, in, in cash and in kind. Uh, and indeed for presence, because many of them are here in, in strong presence. Now, um, very briefly, this, of course, is the fifth ESOF, and I would like also to acknowledge our, our debt to the vision of the founders. Um, in stock, in the organization Euroscience was founded by a, a group of individual scientists who had a vision for a, a, a ground up uh, that is a, a ground level individual membership organization to represent science and speak for science in Europe. And they got together and held the first of these ESOFs in, uh, in Stockholm uh, in 2004. It was a success and they have moved on uh, through Munich uh, and Barcelona and Torino 
and finally here in Dublin, uh, gathering strength, I think, with each move, and I think we'll add strength to it here in Dublin, and we'll move on to Copenhagen in two years' time. So what we're witnessing here is, I think, the first successful decade of something that will be, I think, in 100 years' time, written about as an important turning point uh, in, in not just the history of science, but in, in the history of European cohesion and cooperation and, and, and sense of common purpose in the use of science for society. Uh, at any rate, um, we, of course, built on the, on the successes of these previous ones, and we inherit some of their success. And one reflection of that was that when we went out on the, on the airwaves two years ago to solicit um, contributions to our program, we expected on previous experience that we might get about 200 responses. In fact, we got 420 responses, far more than we have room for in the program. Uh, in fact, uh, just about a quarter of these uh, got through the various uh, committee screenings and so on, and were in, in a very open and transparent way were selected. Uh, so we celebrate the, the quality of the program, and at the same time, um, we uh, honor and, and thank those who in fact took the trouble to put together proposals, which in fact would also make uh, most of them a very good second program if we could have room for one. So uh, there was a, there's a wealth of interest and a wealth of of emerging science there that you would like to hear about. Um, finally, or almost finally, let me say that what you're going to hear over the next four days is science from alpha to omega. And at the alpha end of the scale, of course, you'll hear from uh, Dr. Rolf Dieter Hoyer from the Director General of CERN about the uh, discovery of the most recent and most elusive of the subatomic particles. Now, um, there's great excitement about this around the world, but that's uh, probing the boundaries of our knowledge of the universe we live in at the most micro uh, level that technology uh, up to this has, has not been capable of studying. At the other end of the scale, um, Mrs. Uh, 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 Nelody Pandor, who is the Minister of Science from South Africa, uh, will be here to tell us about the Square Kilometre Array, which has recently been approved and is a multi-billion uh, dollar or euro investment by the global science community to establish the largest radio telescope ever, ever made, 70% uh, of it in African countries and the remainder in Australia. And this spanning two continents, huge investment, decades of work to be done in future, is in fact going to be a little bit like, uh, at the other end of the scale, what has been done in CERN. It's probing the, the limits of the universe. So with this alpha and omega and all between, you have a, a great wealth of, uh, of things to hear in, in more than 100 sessions. Uh, let me draw your attention to one or two innovations this time around. Uh, we have four intercontinental partnerships with uh, China on the uh, city of the future, with North America on the Atlantic as a shared resource, with Africa on sci science for development, uh, and with the ASEAN countries um, cementing and advancing uh, the, the active front of cooperation in science between these two parts of the world. Uh, and we also have, of course, uh, assembled all the science policy related stuff into one day on Friday and that will be uh, led by uh, Maury Gagan Quinn's uh, keynote lecture. So uh, finally, uh, and I suppose in the spirit in which our president started off, may I try to capture some of these thoughts in a short poem uh, which I've called uh, ESOF 2012, Urbi et Orbi. Uh, proud upon the key, the tilted drum beats out a message to the city and the world. Ireland is serious about science. Uh, deep in our past, the light of Christ descended and explained the universe. Today, with laser lights, we probe the darkness, but, energy, but origin and destiny elude us still. Science still has much to do. Thank you very much. Professor Patrick Cunningham, you all have to write a poem, by the way. Yes, <laughs> kind of an informal thing that we're doing. Uh, Professor Cunningham, I was 
pushed hard, obviously, to bring ESOF here to Dublin, but always insisted that it should occur one week after the Higgs boson was discovered, uh, because that man is a public relations genius. Uh, now, so enough of the welcoming. Let's find someone from ESOF itself. Could you please welcome the president of Euroscience, Professor Eric Banda, ladies and gentlemen. Commissioner for Research, Innovation and, and Science, Morgan Queen, Chief Scientific Advisor, Patrick Cunningham, Minister for Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, Richard Bratton, members of Euroscience, colleagues and friends. As President of Euroscience, it is a great pleasure to be here today on the opening of the fifth edition of Euroscience Open Forum. It follows, as it has been said, Stockholm, Munich, Barcelona, and Torino, and will be followed by Copenhagen in 2014. Such a sequence of events has been possible thanks to a very large number of friends. Among them all, may I thank five private foundations whose support has been clue for the continuity of the project. It's the Robert Bosch Stiftung, the Stifter Verband, the Riksbanken's Jubileum Fund, Compagnia di San Paola and Fondazione Cariplo. Of course, a tremendous effort always falls on the shoulders of the organizers. I know that very well. Therefore, I thank wholeheartedly the Dublin team, led by ESOF 2012 champion, Professor Patrick Cunningham. Euroscience, in fact, is a 15 years old grassroots organization, totally independent of political power, that sees science, technology, and innovation as the engine of welfare in Europe. That's our vision. And the Euroscience Open Forum is a biennial meeting where we take stock of scientific achievements and engage in discussions and interactions with all science stakeholders. In Euroscience, we recognize the impetus scientists receive from the European Union. In particular, the European Commission has made a proposal for the Horizon 2020 that contains good news and some issues for debate. We are confident that the modifications expected from the European Parliament and the co-decision process with the Council will give Europe an instrument that will complement those at national levels. From Euroscience, we applaud the continuity of the concept of excellence. The Danish presidency has been particularly active in that sense and supporting the expansion of the European Research Council, the most recent success in research funding at the European level. The ERC was the result of an immense work coming from the bottom, including several debates at previous ESOF meetings. We also welcome the effort to link the value chain of research with innovation. It has been mentioned by Professor Patrick Cunningham, but I will repeat what an emotion was felt by the scientific community on the 4th of July, just over a week ago. The Higgs field discovery deserves a huge celebration. It was a fantastic day for research and therefore for Euroscience as well. Perhaps you saw the loud applause and cheering during the, annou the announcement at CERN replicated in hundreds of labs around the world. It is a European institution that became global a while ago. We face an extraordinary triumph of science, a grassroots success. The discovery of the Higgs boson will certainly offer a better understanding of the university, and it is now our duty to turn that also into a better life. For those of you who believe in the long term, you know it will stimulate and influence our economy. At the same time, we have other challenges, such as beating Alzheimer's disease, as an example. As of today, we do not know how to change the course of this disease. But we will get there. And all these and other challenges have been and will be worked out in our labs, in universities and research institutes, not in the official offices of our capitals. It will be a grassroots success. And if we talk about environment and climate change as another example, we know we must have a better insight into the processes that affect our planet. 
The huge footprint of humanity has a large impact on the world, on its climate in particular. The magnitude of the threat is sizable. Does that mean that we are getting into the Anthropocene as a new geological epoch? Here is yet another challenge which necessarily includes social sciences and the humanities. All of what I have said needs science education. And scientists across Europe must endeavor to, ins to inspire the next generation of scientists. Euroscience is keen to enhance the degree of science education in Europe. If our vision has to be made reality, of course. And how about politicians? From politicians, what do we expect? We expect them to understand that austerity does not mean to cut the essential. And research is essential for our future. Please do preserve the essential for the benefit of future generations. And let solid results from science be an inspiration and a basis for your policies. Crisis. A few years ago, we had some hints of what was coming. Now the hints have materialized into a crude reality. The budgetary pressure on national funding agencies makes them reluctant to continuing efforts in terms of European collaboration. Is the European Science Foundation a victim of it? Europe's division is just the opposite of what we need. Scientists, when it comes to knowledge, do not really want to know about borders. We know we need Europe, more and more Europe, to join forces and to be truly competitive in front of other powers. But we, the grassroots, also have our duties. duties. The situation should stimulate our imagination to overcome the difficult situation we are in. Our constituency should be more engaged. We are aware we have to concentrate in excellent research in an open way that may allow translating our efforts into our hospitals or our industries. We are aware and we must come to the front stage. There are a number of issues I have not even mentioned. I refer, for instance, to the inordinate imbalance when it comes to gender in research. I refer as well to the integrity in research or the social responsibility of researchers. There will, there will I'm sure, be another pressing, other pressing issues that arise during this week in Dublin. And if you are motivated to take these issues further, then I can think of no better starting point than to become a member of Euroscience, as I did myself several years ago. I wish you all an excellent meeting. Thank you very much. Professor Eric Bander there, the president of Euroscience. He was right in saying that the announcement last Wednesday uh, in CERN was greeted with applause in laboratories all over the world, with a wry smile at best in Chicago, uh, where Fermilab probably weren't as thrilled as the rest of us were uh, about the whole result. That should be regarded as a victory for European funding. It should be regarded for a victory for just the commitment made to build such a facility and, to start, and just the efforts made by it. It was a victory for European science. To talk to us further about the European dimension of that, we're part of the Com European Commissioner for Research, Innovation Science here, Maura Gagan Quinn. Kahirli, I can't say I guess I'm in Wisla. Couldn't say I was a good brother. I'm fearing faults. I could rule the fad. Go ahead and I could hardly hear the kahir vlog clear. Tell me, can't you go dug on all kinds of torture? Dish go high dory. I guess go all here. Nach gasen lechele ha minikshin a hacht lechele. O atchi er fudan daun. Dis borachti briver av a gahakub a gahana shachtene. Ach das Sulam gemei deshagi freshen Maradur Daragas Maradur zum Tuchteran Blasche go Chultur nehere na gas gehört hat go Chultur special to Vlachlie. Min Chairman Dara, Minister Bruton, Minister Sherlock, Professor Banda, Professor Cunningham, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. I've been looking forward to this moment for quite some time. The opening of Europe's largest science gathering in Dublin, a city that was my second home for 22 years when I was in politics. And the organizers have timed this event perfectly. 
showing remarkable foresight, as several have said before me, in scheduling it just at the moment when fundamental research has captured the public's imagination and the world's front pages once again, thanks to CERN's historic announcement last week. I couldn't be more pleased that science and research are at the top of the agenda. I say this not just as the European Commissioner for Research, Innovation and Science, but as someone who is utterly convinced that we need more science and better science to improve our well-being, our environment and our economy. Budgets are very tight in Europe, but it is clear to me and indeed to my colleagues in the European Commission that a bigger share of those scarce resources must be devoted to research, science and innovation. However, not everyone understands this and we are facing a battle to maintain the central role of science in European society. There is a real risk that science might be seen as a luxury as governments look to make savings. But science is a necessity, not a luxury. The world is facing large-scale challenges such as climate change, food and energy security, and demographic shifts. Informed decisions on these issues require the best evidence-based knowledge and advice that we can produce. Cutting budgets now would also be a false economy because science is one of our keys to our recovery. In Europe, those countries who have invested in research are weathering the crisis much better. Innovative companies are more resilient, continuing to attract customers with the best products and services. Investment in science is investment in competitiveness and jobs. But for me, scientific inquiry is also important in itself. Curiosity-driven research defines and shapes progress. The Large Hadron Collider may generate spin-offs and business opportunities, but it also has a noble quest for answers to some of the most fundamental questions of physics. The European Commission champions the need for more and better science and wants to give our scientists the funding they deserve. This week, we launched the biggest ever call for proposals under Framework Programme 7, worth 8 billion euro. In the long term, we have also proposed to increase European support for research and innovation from the 55 billion euro budget for Framework Programme 7 to 80 billion euro for our new programme, Horizon 2020. Starting in 2014, Horizon 2020 will fund everything from basic best frontier research through to close market uh, applied science and innovation. I'm relying on your active support for our proposal. It has been designed with you in mind, scientists, researchers and innovators. So I hope that you'll stand up and be counted, be proactive, engage with politicians and decision makers, convince policymakers, especially those in charge of budgets, to invest in science. Keep on engaging with the general public so that they can appreciate that science is at their service in all areas of life, and I'll be with you all the way. I would like to thank the Irish organizers, FERFOS, and Euroscience for all their hard work in preparing such an ambitious event. I don't usually single out individuals, but I think Professor Patrick Cunningham deserves particular recognition for his enormous achievement in winning the bid for ESOF to come to Dublin and for delivering what promises to be ESOF's most impressive program ever. The European Commission is proud to support ESOF once again because you are providing an invaluable platform for debate and discovery that helps science and the rest of society to engage with each other. ESOF also gives us a chance to discuss the most burning issues in science and in technology, showcase the best in public and private research in Europe, and connect with the general public. My biggest thanks of all go to the scientists, 
the researchers and innovators that are participating. A better Europe will be built on your knowledge, your ideas, and your creativity. That's a tall order, but I know that all of you are up for it. Thank you. Gurmila Margaret O'Wire there. Thank you very much. You Maura Gagan Quinn, European Commissioner for Research, Innovation and Science. Uh, as Professor Cunningham mentioned already, this event wouldn't have occurred without the support of the government. To speak on their behalf, could we please mention, uh, oops, sorry, please welcome, excuse me, the Minister for Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, Richard Bruton. Well, th thanks very much, Dara. I, I must say I'm humbled to be here among poets, uh, comedians, and scientists. Uh, they're all people who, I suppose, explore the boundaries of our limits uh, as human beings in different ways, particularly perhaps the comedian more than any other. Uh, but it, it is wonderful to be here. I, I, I think one thing that science may, it may set a limit to our knowledge, but it certainly shouldn't set a limit to our imagination. And I think the President's address here the, the, uh, earlier I think just reminded us that science ultimately is about the values which we bring to the challenges. And I think it's a very important that as we journey questioning and seeking to learn more about our, our environment, uh, more about the challenges we face, we must do that with purposes in mind. And I think it was a, a very timely reminder uh, for us uh, that, that that's at the heart of, of what we're about. And I think it's, it's important to our favorite commissioner, if you like, is here. I know no commissioner represents any country, but Maura Gagan Quinn is, Quinn is most welcome here. And I, I think what she's doing with her research program also goes to the heart of the, the nature of, of, of what science should be about. Because she emphasizes not just good science, she emphasizes not just, you know, enterprising and imaginative people willing to invest, but she emphasizes at the core, this is about meeting world challenges. And I think that's so important uh, in any research program, and it, it reflects the importance that the president uh, ascribed in his few words. I think we as a country who are facing enormous challenges, we have made a commitment as a government that science is going to be part of the way in which we meet these challenges. And I think the reason why Paddy Cunningham was able to win this competition, if like to bring this wonderful conference and make Dublin uh, the city of science, it was because I think there has been no mean achievement here in Ireland among scientists and researchers to build up from a very low base something that now is in the top 20 in, in the world in terms of the quality of the research we can do here. I think we have built an, an openness, and I suppose it, it builds on the, our, our character. There is an openness and a, an ability to share. And I think we have developed you know, very close relationships with, you know, between companies, and we're lucky, I suppose, to have some of the most ambitious and creative companies in the world picking Ireland as a place to do business. But we've built really good links between those ambitious companies with high quality research that's now being conducted in, in our institutes of higher education. And we want to make more of, of, of that. And Sean Sherlock, who's here, the Minister of State, his role in government is to, to drive our capacity to use that knowledge to best effect, to make sure that we're continuing to invest in, in important knowledge, but also that we're applying that at, at a time of great stress, that we're sweating the assets we've created to, to deliver for ordinary people. And if we look to where will Ireland be in 5, 10, 15 years' time, it will be in our ability to bring technology to bear on traditional sectors like food, perhaps, but also to, to use the power of technology to open up its full possibilities for our people and for our, for our businesses. It is really an exciting time, and we are absolutely delighted that Dublin has been chosen and that people from all over the world can come here to meet our people, to encourage people along the route to take up science. And I know careers is a big part of it. We suffered a property crash in the recent times and the damage wasn't just to the banks and to the 
you know, the, the, the estates that weren't filled, but it also has damaged the sort of choices that people made about their careers. And perhaps we lost sight of the importance of science and technology. Now that is being restored and there's an understanding that that is the route for small open economies who want to trade globally. We must invest in, in science, in maths, in engineering, in, and encourage people to go down that road. This uh, week and the whole year is a great chance to not just showcase Ireland as a location, but showcase to Irish people the power, the wisdom, the uh, sheer excitement of science, which I suppose many of us got driven out of us during our years of education. This is a much more full expression of the excitement of science, and I'm thrilled to be a, a, a part of it. I come from a, a profession that they say knows the uh, price of everything but the value of nothing. But hopefully, uh, you know, we economists and we economists who end up in government, so we're doubly handicapped, uh, can hopefully show that there is a little bit of wisdom still and that we, we can make choices that put value on, on, you know, pushing those boundaries of knowledge to challenge our thinking. And I think that's what science can do. It can challenge our thinking. And it's so important that we continue to be open to the wonders of science. And I'm, I'm thrilled that so many people have given up their time with huge dedication to make this a reality. Paddy Cunningham, who comes from Dunboyne, where I come from myself, a tiny little village, uh, but well, not in, originally, but it's his adopted village. Uh, and I'm thrilled for, for him because he has been so dedicated as a geneticist uh, throughout his whole career. He has carried the wisdom and the excitement of science to so many generations of young people. And I'm thrilled to see that you know, he has been the one to, to achieve this great uh, achievement for the city of Dublin and indeed for the country of Ireland. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Have you been welcomed enough now? Have you got the idea? You're, you're very welcome, all right? We've done that in a couple of sentences, really, to be honest, in many, many ways.